This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not medical care or advice. Clinicians should rely on their own medical judgments when advising their patients. Patients in need of medical care should consult their personal care provider. A new baby means lots of trips to the doctors in the first two years. So why are they important and what can you expect? Hi, I'm Tonya Caruso. Welcome to this UPMC Health Beat podcast. And joining us right now is Dr. Pamela Schomer. She's a pediatrician and medical director of quality safety and outcomes for UPMC Children's Community Pediatrics. Thank you so much for joining well, us. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is such an important topic. Such an important topic, and I can't even imagine, especially for first-time parents, a new baby, and you think, I need to go to the doctors all of these times? Why are these visits so important? So these visits are so important. One thing, because as you just mentioned, you need to build that relationship with your pediatrician. It's somebody that is gonna help you parent through the next 18 or more years of life. but. Those new babies don't come with an instruction booklet. So oftentimes there are questions or problems that you can't foresee. And so having those frequent visits with that pediatrician are gonna help to anticipate those and then make you feel like a better parent because you know what to expect. Right. So in general, if a baby is healthy without any uh, major medical conditions, mm -hmm. how many times over the coming two years will a baby have to go to the doctors? So routine care would be about 10 times. Um, average is about every other month, although more at the beginning and a little less frequently as you get closer to that two-year age. And so when do these first begin? So after a baby's born, parents may know there are some immediate tests that take place in the hospital. Right. But then we actually recommend that you be seen by your pediatrician within about two to three days after leaving the hospital. That trip home and that transition can be a little tough. And sometimes you haven't seen your pediatrician in the hospital. It's been a different doctor. So you want to build that relationship and kind of establish that care quickly. All right. So that very first visit, when a patient comes to see you, what takes place? Obviously, in many cases, it's your first trip to the office. So you'll meet with our staff and there'll be some information gathering. And then one of our clinical staff will measure your baby, kind of make sure that they're growing well, ask if you have any concerns. And then when the pediatric provider comes in, they're going to talk to you about things such as feeding, sleep, and even how the family is doing with a new one in the family. And so what happens after that? When's the next visit after that? And, and with each visit, are there things that are standard that you check for? And then with each visit, is there sort of a different milestone? Absolutely, so that first visit, it depends a little how weight's going in a newborn period. Most babies will have lost weight, so we'll see them back for a weight check one or two times in that next couple of weeks to make sure things are going well. And then that next visit after that, once the baby's back to birth weight, would be at a month of age. And again, it's to review all of the issues that may have occurred. You'll see a lot of patterns in our well visits. You know, when you first come in, just like that newborn visit, there's information that's gathered, baby is measured, um, we're plotted on a growth curve so you can kind of follow that along. And then you'll meet with the provider to talk about feeding and sleeping and skin care, answering your questions, all the things you'd anticipate. Each visit does kind of have its own emphasis. So a lot of times that will direct the conversation. Most parents, when they come in their newborn, the first question they ask is when are immunizations? And the first ones, other than at that new, at the, in the hospital or newborn visit, would be at two months. So oftentimes that is the focus of that visit, is talking through what we're protecting against, what to expect, and all of those. What are some of those immunizations at two months? Yes, yeah, so at two months you actually get a series of, and it can vary a little by practice to practice, but typically it's three injections and one medicine by mouth. Um, and it protects against things like tetanus and whooping cough, meningitis, pneumonia, and then a stomach virus called rotavirus, which before immunization was about the number two cause for hospitalization in infants. And now we don't see it all that often or certainly doesn't lead to hospitalization. It sounds like a lot yes. of vaccines at one time, but really our immune system is meant to react to many things at a time. If you think about when we put our fingers in our mouth or we wash our skin, there's a lot of germs. So in, a, in many cases, these vaccines given together actually enhance the immune response and give your baby better protection. We start young because that's when the baby is most at risk for serious illness. So we know at two months, they can build an immune response and it will start to get them protected so that those serious diseases 
don't impact their life. Yeah. Is there any reason you would delay from the two months? So there are a few, but very few. Mostly it would be because if the baby itself had an immune problem or was ill. But even premature babies can get vaccines based on their time since birth, not their age when they were expected. Mm. So in most cases, we can start those right at two months. Yeah. All right, so we get the vaccines, the first Absolutely. vaccines out of the way. When they come back the next time, yes. where are we and so what are we doing? At four months and six months, it's easy. Those are the same immunizations. But I think that's the time we really start to talk about social skills, them learning and getting their own little personality. Um, and also being prepared for starting to change food from maybe an all liquid diet, be it formula or breast milk, just thinking about solids and that food readiness, and then baby proofing the house because pretty soon that baby's not gonna be stationary, they're gonna be moving. So those are kind of more the focuses of that. Always answering people's questions, which there are oftentimes many of, but mm -hmm. that would be the focus in there. What are some of the most common questions you might get from parents at that age group? So at four months, I think starting foods and how to start foods is, is always one because everybody wants to you know, put a finger full of mashed potatoes or ice cream. And, and that philosophy has changed a lot over the time. So we really do talk about food readiness and not every baby is ready to eat at exactly the same age. So we help the parent make that decision. And then of course, when do I expect in their development? When are they gonna be rolling? When are they gonna be moving? Because that's what we all think about when we see babies is we think about the cute little crawling baby across the floor. Right. So, when, um, so how has that changed when it comes to food over time? What are some of the conversations you're having now that are different from in the past. Right. So years ago, they actually talked about delaying the start of food, worried about food allergies. And, and that has changed. So really we talk about introduction a little earlier because we know that the immune system then builds up resistance to that. And they're actually less likely to develop an allergy rather than the philosophy before. And again, six months used to kind of be that age. And now we recognize some babies at four months who are holding their head up well and reaching fruit and, and interested getting that texture in, teaching them to get that food off a spoon may actually help us with success later on to eliminate some picky eaters. Wow, that is so fascinating. Yes. And yeah. I, that's just, as you were saying early, this is important for parents for a number of reasons. You tend to just think medical and health, but you know something so, so social and so vital to be able to have that conversation. A absolutely, and in those first six months or so, we also see parents sometimes go through some postpartum depression. So we wanna make sure we're screening for that and, and being cautious that the family, um, I, either parent really has that support they may need because it's not sometimes as picture perfect mm -hmm. as we might want it to be and our own hormones, our own moods can get in the way and eliminate our ability to enjoy this right. process. And when you talk about rolling over and those types of milestones, Absolutely. when typically does that take place or is there a typical? So there is a typical and I, and I kind of in my mind group it as six months and on is really the movement time. You always wanna be careful with rolling over because there are babies at a couple of days of life sometimes that by perpetual motion can kind of get themselves flipped over. So you never wanna leave a baby up high, but really that six months and on tends to be that time when baby's gonna be exploring physically their environment. Okay, six months now, we have food under control, um, baby's rolling over, when do we next come back to see you? So six months is under, is under the belt, so nine months is our next visit. And that's really when we start to see some independence. That baby's probably pretty mobile at this point in time, or, or certainly on the doorstep of it. Um, but they're also starting to express their independence of opinion. So we see a lot of kind of what we call separation anxiety, where they decide who can hold them. They decide who they're going to talk with. They decide all of those. And that's a big change for a lot of parents because instead of this smiley little baby that goes to anyone, they're showing those preferences. And so oftentimes that's a big focus along with kind of cleaning up some of the issues from previous visits. And is there anything in particular beyond that that you are looking for at, at this stage? Right, so at nine months, we typically also screen for lead toxicity. So it is a blood test that we do. Because the baby's exploring, there may be lead in the environment that they are taking from their hands, putting in their mouth, or just ingesting. So we'll do that. We also look for anemia at that age because they're transitioning away from iron fortified foods with cereals, with formulas. And, and we wanna make sure that 
again, their stores are good enough to carry them into that next phase. So is, that's a blood test? It is a blood test. And again, each office is going to be a little different. At UPMC Children's Community Pediatrics, we typically are able to do that right in our office. So the parents have at least the hemoglobin or the iron test in the office. The lead test gets sent out and takes a couple of days. Okay, what happens after that? So at nine months, then we move to a year. Um, and at a year, again, we've, we've got more development. That's when we get the questions if my baby's not quite walking yet or how many words should we have. Um, and of course, sleep. Somewhere along that first year, we want those sleep routines to be well established. And now that your baby's moving, if they aren't, we really need to kind of help encourage that because pretty soon they're gonna wanna be climbing out of that bed. And if they're not good sleepers, you may find them anywhere in the house let alone hear that thump that you don't want to hear as they fall out of bed. So when it comes to the milestones of walking, what is typical mm -hmm. um, and what do you say to parents if their baby's not walking okay. at that time? So it's, it's a little later than most people think. Average is about 13 and a half months. So walking, I would say average nine to 18 months. But again, once your baby is up and cruising or pulling to stand, they're well on their way. So that's what we look for. If they aren't there yet, we may refer them for some therapy to help them or just talk through ways that you can encourage it. You know, some babies may be held a little bit more or not have quite those opportunities. So we wanna encourage those parents to explore how they can help their child explore the world around them. Right, and so it must be fun for you as you see babies come in and, and you watch them grow this entire time. Absolutely. You know, we really become part of the family in a lot of cases because, as you mentioned, it's not always medical. Sometimes it's about parenting. Sometimes it's about anticipatory guidance, what to expect next. And so those are fun, but it's also fun to share in the, the achievements. When the baby walks at the first time, we want to know that. And, um, you know, it's just part of that marker of, of being a, a patient-centered medical home uh, that we all want to be. Right, okay, what happens next, the next time I come back? So I think staying a little bit with 12 months, I think the other thing is, is everybody thinks about terrible twos and the tantrums, but really at a year, you can start to kind of form some of the behaviors in yourself as a parent that helps to eliminate those. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about that. And, and that's giving a child choices. We know that they make choices, but choices within limits, not what do you want, but do you want this or do you want that? because it allows your child to be independent, but you still have that control. Also, I always tell my parents, don't ask the question you don't want an answer to, because once they learn the word no, you're gonna hear it often, and if you've asked and they say no, and you do it anyway, they're kind of offended by that. They've, they've told you no, even if it's something they wanna do. So phrasing things like, it's time to go to bed, rather than, it, do you wanna go to bed? So that you let them know and expect it, not that they have a choice, whether this is the end of the day. And building routines into those as well, so that they know what bedtime looks like, or they know what bath time looks like, so they themselves can kind of prepare, play a role in it, and feel part of it, but not be the, the bosses of the family. When you were talking about no and learning no, I know some parents that uh, try never to say no, but redirect, rephrase. And, and is that something that you think is a good idea? A absolutely, I think that works much better and to give them more attention when they're doing something you want them to be doing rather than what they're not. So distracting, if it's safe, sometimes just some ignoring is also okay. And saving no for times that it's really danger when you wanna get their attention. If you say it less, you may also hear it a little bit less. Very good. Okay, so beyond one year, you mm -hmm. think we're starting to cruise, but we're still coming back to visit a you. Absolutely, and some of this has to do with our immunization schedule because at all of the visits, um, minus that nine month visit when we talked about the blood test, there are routine immunizations. But at 15 and 18 months, again, that independent little person is weaning from formula or breast milk to milk, to a cup, learning to feed themselves and learning to, to play in different ways, learning their imagination, and then of course learning their language skills. So we want to assess and make sure that all of that is developing and that they're growing the way that they should be. Right, and you touched on this earlier. If there is an issue or you do see a problem, it's really about what happens next and, and what can we do um, to help this baby progress. So it depends on the issue, whether we do some watchful waiting. We see, okay, is this within normal but just a little delayed and we'll follow up with you, maybe even a little sooner than that next well visit. 
Um, or we have lots of services that we can use, including evaluation for occupational or physical therapy, or as they get older, even speech therapy. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, we need to do medical evaluations to make sure there's not a medical problem that's causing it. And that's all part of that picture of making sure that we're going to get your child to the potential that they have as they get older. Yeah, and, and so you mentioned this as well. With every visit, with the exception of that nine month, there mm -hmm. are immunizations. There are. What do you want to say to parents about the importance of those and how many things are babies protected by by the time they come and see you? Just a ballpark. Going to make me count, yeah. but um, it's, it's more than 15. We talked about some of the early ones, but in that second year, we're going to get protection against measles, mumps, and rubella, chicken pox, hepatitis A, which is a food board illness, and again, boosters for those others. You know, we're really protecting against things that can affect them, not only in infancy, but lifelong. People sometimes ask about the chickenpox vaccine mm -hmm. because many of us have survived chickenpox, but we forget that if we've had chickenpox, we're gonna get shingles as we get older. If we never get chickenpox, not only do we spare that serious illness, but we spare something in adulthood as well. So it's really just important. And as a pediatrician, I think it's one of the most important things I do. I'm not sure it's my patients always feel that way. But you know, in my career, I've actually seen children have bad outcomes mm -hmm. from many of these diseases that we can now protect against, so families don't have to deal with that. Right, so that's so important. Okay, we're moving on. Yeah. Where are we now? Absolutely, so I think at that 15, 18 month, we're yeah. talking about tantrums, we're talking about development. We're still making sure and checking in that we're doing dental care, that we're sleeping well, that we're eating well, all of those other topics that were kind of in the beginning as well and then helping to empower that parent to know what is next. And then eventually they graduate to that two-year visit and we probably celebrate the two-year visit just as much as the one-year visit. Two-year-olds tend to like parties better than one-year-olds. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and at that visit, they have typically already finished those childhood immunizations. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that visit's also a little more fun that there isn't a shot involved. Yeah. So after those, how often does someone have to come back and see yeah. you? So we do a two and a half year physical um, because there is a lot of development that still occurs in that second year. So we wanna make sure that we're checking in with growth and development, but then starting at three, it's yearly. Okay. And yearly up until we're old. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't change even as, as whether you're a toddler or a preschooler. Um, or an adolescent, you really should be getting a yearly Welch visit. Oh, right, and, and so I wanna ask you, what do you want to say to parents about how to prepare for these appointments sure. and, and really um, what you want them to be thinking when they come to see you and get to spend time with you? You know, you prepare for your relationship with your pediatrician, sometimes even before the baby's born. So go and meet and go see the office and, and make sure it's a good fit location-wise and personality-wise. And that's not odd. That is Some, not. Uh, someone who's going to be a new parent can call up an office and say, I'm looking for a pediatrician can I come and check you out? Absolutely. And it's something that you would want to, to see because if people aren't open to kind of meet you, then are they going to be there as well when you need them? So you want that welcoming environment. But I think for each visit, it's really about writing down your questions. Think about what has been going on, what you may have had questions about, and also be prepared to update with what's changed. So if your baby's been ill, if you've seen another provider, kind of be prepared to let your pediatrician know that. Mm -hmm. They obviously may have gotten notification about that, but if you saw somebody outside of a system, they may not have. So that way you can add that to the medical record and the discussion. Many practices will also send out information ahead of time. So that might be educational information or it might be some gathering mm -hmm. information about development or eating habits. And that will save you if you do that before you get to the visit, trying to feel rushed when you're there. Right. And don't save everything for your checkup. If you're really having a concern in between, that's why we're here. Ask beforehand so that your well visit isn't necessarily about a cold or a stomach virus or an illness, that it's really about those important subjects that we kind of talked about. Are there dumb questions? What do you want to say to parents about? There, there are no dumb questions. Um, and going to other, other sources to get answers to questions sometimes is a dumb way to get the answer though. <laughs> Are you talking um, about if we're searching online? Yes. Um, well, and, it, and dumb is probably not the correct word, but it may not be the most up-to-date or the medical standard. Like we talked about with food, what great-grandma did feeding-wise 40 or 50 years ago may look very different to what's recommended now. So make sure that you check what your beliefs are, what your practices are, 
And if you're not sure what a recommendation is, ask. Have it be a conversation just like we're having now. How did you end up in this field of medicine and, and wanting to be in pediatrics? And do you see all of these kids as your family? I'm going to answer that last part first. Um, they are definitely my family, and I take their concerns and their joys home with me every day, and I share in those. So that is a huge part of my job satisfaction is building those relationships. Um, but the way I got into this is, first of all, who couldn't want to go to work with kids? And when you get to partner with families to work towards a common goal, and that's a healthy child. Um, but personally, I also had some medical concerns when I was a child, and so I learned good and bad from the physicians that took care of me, and it helped shape the kind of pediatrician that I am. Thank you so much for coming in and spending time with us today. Some great information. I'm sure lots of new parents out there will be so thankful when they get to hear you. Um, thank you for your time today. Thank you for allowing me to share, and again, when you have questions, talk to your pediatrician. Thanks again. I'm Tonya Caruso. Thank you for joining us. This is UPMC HealthBeat.